Uh, companies like Airbnb, uh, which offer short-term accommodation to rival traditional hotels, have been continuing to rise in popularity for really sort of the last sort of decade mm -hmm. or so. And there are calls for stricter controls on short-term lettings after concerns about rising city centre house prices and noisy guests in residential areas. We'll be joined by, in a moment by someone from the industry, but first John Maguire sent this report from Bath, which is a city struggling to cope with so many extra bedrooms. The World Heritage City of Bath is already heating up for the tourist season, but some visitors here are more welcome than others. One issue, dozens of large properties that can be rented out as party houses. These places are empty during the week, noisy at the weekend, but in the week you, you've basically seen this hollowing out phenomenon of significant elements of the street being, being empty, and that affects the sense of community, actually affects, affects your sense of security. In the centre, close to Bath's Regency, Roman and Rugby attractions, there's an eclectic range of accommodation, from Airbnb to five-star luxury. But hoteliers here say the market is oversupplied and increasingly unfair. The short-term rentals and holiday lets, they're another dimension. We would ask that these types of accommodation providers adhere to the same criteria that uh, traditional hotels uh, have to adhere to. Fire regs, PAT testing, business rates, VAT, which of course are things that make it increasingly more difficult to operate in a competitive industry. Alison Curran runs a letting business and adheres to the same rules and regulations as hotels. Professional holiday rental owners who are aware of their responsibilities work on exactly the same basis as B&Bs and hotels. I think where the difference comes is that it's harder to enforce the legislation um, on holiday rental properties because they're harder to identify and, and that is an issue, I think. City councils around the world are struggling to get to grips with this issue and here they believe the government should do more to help. I don't like bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake, but we need a new planning class possibly, somewhere between um, a, a hotel and a, a normal residential house, because by doing this I'm actually losing an awful lot of residential houses as well. I don't think people always realise that's the issue. But the government says short-term lettings help households to boost their income and promote economic growth through tourism, arguing further legislation would stifle growth but it insists people must rent out accommodation responsibly. And Airbnb says it has worked with over 500 governments across the world on measures to help families share their homes, follow the rules and pay tax. It's often the history that attracts people to our most popular cities, but what those visitors do, where they stay and where they spend their money is constantly changing. John Maguire, BBC News, Bath. Well, there's lots of different uh, points of view in that. Uh, Richard Bridger uh, joins us now. He's the chief operating officer of a short-term lettings company. Morning to you. Morning. And let's just deal with some of the sort of concerns um, by hoteliers. For example, they're saying it's unfair, you don't have to obey fire regulations, uh, business regulations, uh, pay VAT, pay tax. What's your response? Well, I think it's important to remember who the vast majority of people are who are kind of letting out their home. In most instances, it's ordinary families who go away on holiday, business travellers who travel quite a lot for work, people who sometimes got a second home, whether it's for in the city or in the countryside. And so they're there using it themselves a lot of the time. Um, but obviously it's sat empty sometimes. And during those periods of when it's sat empty, instead of leaving it empty, short-term rentals enable them to let it out, welcome guests, uh, and earn some money themselves. So it's vast, in most cases, it's really just a very part-time operation. So you'd expect if it's good enough for them to live there, then it would be good enough for people to stay there occasionally. I suppose those concerns are like you know, the um, sort of legislative, you know, the regulations, pat testing, those sort of things. What about the effect on the community, which, which some people have talked about as well? Yeah, we actually find that a lot of the time the guests who stay leave a lighter footprint. I mean, a lot of the time it's people who are coming to be tourists, that they're out and about, business travellers are at work, people seeing friends and family. So they use it as a base, but they don't actually stay in the home very much themselves. You will, as with you know, any neighbour, whether it's they live there permanently or whether they're just staying there part-time, you'll get some noisy ones. And in those instances, you want to have the right 
processes in place so that you can catch that, stop that, and try and stop it, because no one wants noisy neighbours. But it's not actually the vast majority of cases. It's quite a rare thing. I mean, shouldn't, why should they... Um, I mean, because, you know, they are making money out of it, as you, mm -hmm. as you say. Why shouldn't they have to comply with the same criteria as other businesses? B&B, for example. Well, on tax and things like that. Well, on, on everything. Well, I mean, if you're a homeowner, then it counts as income. So you're already paying tax, which is at least 20%, and potentially 40%. So actually, your tax rate is going to be higher as a homeowner than it will as a business. What about, um, we talked about fire regulations and checking as well. Yeah, yeah. No, it's important that all hosts um, uh, do a fire safety assessment. That's something that we recommend to our homeowners. It's something that all of the platforms recommend themselves. Um, and actually, we're in discussions with the National Fire Council on just the best way to ensure that happens. Typically, it's just a simpler setup. If you've got a hotel with 300 rooms, obviously you've got more complex requirements that you need to assess than if you've got uh, a home with three bedrooms. Do you stay in any hotels anymore yourself? Unfortunately, I stayed in one last night, but I mean, I don't know if you've got that, kids, that, but like a family that, yeah. room that the kids stuck at the end of the bed, you've got to go to, they go to bed at 8 p.m. What are you supposed to do with yourself? You know, staying in a home is just a more relaxing, enjoyable experience. So when you go away now, if you're going away on a, on a if you've got family yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you go away on a family holiday, you would you do it all Always via... try and find a, a home, absolutely. Because it's just got that balance. You've got a kitchen, you've got a separate living room, you've got bedrooms, and you can just relax a bit more. Yeah, but you've levels of service in a hotel, haven't you? And somebody to actually make your breakfast in bed and breakfast. Well, I mean, that's what varies. You've got everything that ranges from uh, individual homeowners who say, come and stay in my room, and actually they're often really, really friendly, all the way through to higher-end providers like under the doormat where we provide concierge service. Mm. So you kind of get that service of a hotel but in the comfort of home. I suppose it becomes, it's grown so much yeah. that it's, it's an, hour, an industry that people are looking at regulation because it's become so popular. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Really As I say, it's a real treat for me to somebody have to make my breakfast. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.